This is BBC News. I'm Ben Brown. The headlines at nine. Charities are warned they could lose government funding if they don't cooperate fully with the authorities in cases of sexual exploitation by staff. The Foreign Secretary is holding talks in Myanmar about the return of Rohingya Muslims. A report commissioned by a group of MPs warns of major problems faced by children in England whose parents drink too much. He smashed all the windows through by the door and he was waving a knife through, the, through one of the, the windows and the police coming up and taking him away. At the same time as trying to deal with it all, you, you're, you're also trying to keep it secret. So it's, it's about just keep suppressing it. Also in this hour, Great Britain's Andrew Musgrave makes history at the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, finishing seventh in the men's 30-kilometer skiathlon, the best ever result for a GB athlete. And meanwhile, in the arena, the North Korean cheerleaders who stole the show in the arena. People had to change seats in the venue so that they could all sit together. And this was the result. Incredible synchronization. Uh, and our Sunday morning edition of the papers is coming up for you at 9.35. This morning's reviews are the broadcaster Lynn Foltzwood and the political editor of The Sun on Sunday, Dave Wooding. Hello, good morning and welcome to BBC News. There's a warning today that charities will lose government funding if they fail to ensure that vulnerable people are properly protected. The International Development Secretary, Penny Mordaunt, has described as horrific the behaviour of some of Oxfam's workers in Haiti who were accused of using prostitutes in the aftermath of the earthquake there. Well, the charity is now also facing new allegations about some of its workers in Chad. Andy Moore has this report. After Haiti, now new allegations about the behavior of some Oxfam workers in Chad in Central Africa. They date back to 2006 and also involve prostitutes. The head of mission in Chad at the time was the same man who resigned from Oxfam five years later because of the scandal in Haiti. Oxfam said it was shocked and dismayed about the latest revelations from Chad. It said it couldn't corroborate the information, but it hired unacceptable behavior by a small number of people. The International Development Secretary Penny Mordaunt has now sent a strong warning to all UK charities receiving public money that those funds will be withdrawn unless they can prove they are cooperating fully with the authorities on safeguarding issues. She said, I am very clear we will not work with any organization that does not live up to the high standards on safeguarding and protection that we require. She called the behavior by some Oxfam workers in Haiti horrific and said it was just one example of a wider issue on which her department was already taking action. The former Secretary of State for International Development is also calling for tougher action. This is now an opportunity for everyone to make sure that there are very clear, not just guidelines, but you know, actions, action will be taken and money will be withdrawn as well, quite frankly. Oxfam says that after Haiti, it set up a dedicated safeguarding team to deal with such issues. The charity finds itself at the centre of this particular scandal, but the British government says it's one example of a wider problem. Andy Moore, BBC News. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Emma Vardy. Uh, Emma, what exactly are the government then saying about how aid agencies need to behave in future? Well, they've issued some really strong messages today. The statement from Penny Mordaunt says that charities across the country are going to be receiving letters. They're going to be told to set out their safeguarding guidelines and told in very clear terms that if there are any issues, then, then those are going to have to be flagged up to the relevant authorities. And as we're hearing in that report, the consequences of um, not adhering to this will be that you will lose um, your foreign aid money. Now, of course, that's incredibly important because there have been questions um, about foreign and aid budgets and for, for many years conservative MPs saying in some cases it should be cut and another scandal like this um, Penny Morden is going to know very well that this will only uh, serve in some cases to undermine public confidence in the way that foreign aid money is spent.
Uh, because this is a story that's sort of snowballing, really. It started with these allegations about Oxfam in Haiti, but other allegations as well now. Well, that's right. Penny Morden today has been speaking about a wider problem uh, that the Department for International Development is aware of. We also heard a uh, previous ministers speaking about this. Andrew Mitchell, the former international uh, Secretary for International Development has spoken about he was aware of problems involving UN peacekeeping soldiers. Um, so there is clearly a bigger problem here. How big, we're not sure, but it is starting to feel like one of those scandals that hits the headlines, uh, which then casts a light on, on a larger problem. And at the moment, um, it's unclear just how wide that problem goes, but uh, we're going to hear from Penny Morden later this morning, and she'll be asked that question. All right, Emma, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. And let's stay with this story because we can speak now to the Labour MP for Hove, Peter Kyle, who worked as an aid worker back in the 1990s. Thank you very much for being with us. I mean, what are your thoughts about uh, the revelations that we've seen? Is this a problem, do you think, this issue of uh, sexual exploitation of people in, in vulnerable places by aid workers? Is this something that you have knowledge of? Uh, no, I don't have knowledge of sexual exploitation of aid workers. But I think what needs to be uncovered and what needs to be got a grip on is just the sort of people who go into some of this work in the front line, but also to make sure that the front line work in crisis situations is performance managed in the right way. It is extremely difficult to find the very, very best doctors to go into areas where it is crisis, it's conflict and it's war. Uh, you know yourself, because many of the places that I worked in the 1990s, Ben, you were reporting from. And you know how difficult it is in some of these areas to actually work, to live, to have a functional life and to support some of the most very vulnerable people in the world. Now, I did see that in frontline aid work, in areas of crisis, some dysfunctional people made their way into those jobs simply because the dysfunction of the, uh, the work made them feel very functional. I did see some people and meet some people who I absolutely would not want to be caring for my own family, my own parents, for example, if they were ever in that situation. And that, for me, was the litmus test. So you're saying the aid agencies, the charities, need to work a bit harder about the, the personnel they recruit? I think they do. And I think also they need to be much more open-spirited in, in the way they work in the front line. There is a territorialism and a competitiveness that has crept into frontline aid work in, co in conflict areas which is counterproductive. They need to be sharing resources much more, they need to be sharing expertise much more, and they need to be much more open when there is a, a personnel or a, mem or a member of staff who falls short of the standards that's needed. They need to make sure that other aid workers and aid agencies know about this. And I'll just say a couple of other things about how they can get out of this situation. I think the United Nations, even though it has problems itself, is the only organisation that has legitimacy in these sorts of areas. I think the UN needs to put a lot more focus into how it monitors and polices these conflict areas and these areas of crisis after a humanitarian catastrophe, because these places are lawless. They are dysfunctional. All of the normal attributes of society have collapsed. So a, an organisation needs to be there policing it. I saw in the front line of aid work that the British military did extraordinary work. And very often the British military were in these areas before the United Nations was even in these areas. In one, a one area where 50,000 refugees arrived in a very short space of time, it took six weeks for some of the international bodies to arrive. So aid agencies were left completely alone, dealing with an extremely difficult situation. People need to realise that the vast majority of aid work in crisis situations is extraordinary. It saves lives. It helps people who are very, very vulnerable. But aid agencies need to do a lot, lot more to make sure that the best people are going into these areas. They are monitored and that these people who are very vulnerable, they have a voice too in how this unfolds. What I'm saying is very difficult. It's not easy, but I'm sure it can be done. And finally, if you'll give me 10 seconds, people like Preeti Patel, they need to get off their high horse. She resigned from her job through corruption herself and, and misconduct. And for her to go around and start beating the aid agencies up at a time when, they're, when they need support very often to get, to get these things right is not right. There are Tory MPs and MPs who are suspended at the moment because of sexual misconduct. She's not out there saying that they, the Tory party needs to have its money taken away. These are very, very difficult, difficult issues that need tackling. We in Britain 
had problems in Rotherham and other parts of the country with sexual exploitation of young, young women. So it happens in countries even when there is a, a functional police force, a schools system that can care for young people, a social services service which cares for young people. So you can imagine how difficult it is to get these things right in humanitarian yeah. catastrophe areas. But that means the onus to get it right is even higher. We can do it, we must do it, and the British forces need to play a bigger role, the UN needs to play a much, much bigger role, and perhaps the EU too. Okay, uh, and I know Priti Patel would uh, contest some of those things you've said, but she's not here to defend herself. But for the moment, um, thank you very much indeed. That's the Labour MP for Hove, Peter Kyle, who was an aid worker in the 1990s. Thanks for your time. Well, the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, has met the leader of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, for talks. Nearly 700,000 Rohingya Muslim refugees have crossed the border into neighbouring Bangladesh after a crackdown by the Burmese military. Rita Chakrabarti is travelling with the Foreign Secretary and sent us this report, which does contain some flash photography. There were smiles this morning as Boris Johnson shook hands with Aung San Suu Kyi in the capital Naipitor, but the plight of the Rohingya people will be a difficult topic. The Burmese leader has suffered a spectacular fall from grace in international public opinion after failing to defend the rights of the Rohingya. <laughs> Boris Johnson met Suu Kyi on a tour of one of the camps in Bangladesh yesterday and said that international diplomacy needed to focus on a safe and dignified return home for them. It's about finding a political solution, finding an answer uh, in Myanmar, uh, from Burma, uh, creating the conditions for a safe, uh, dignified return uh, for these people. That's what they want. They do want to go back, but they don't feel safe. But he admitted that right now that seemed a distant prospect. Later today, Mr. Johnson will be taken by the Myanmar military on a tour of Rakhine State, from where the refugees have fled, alleging arson, looting, rape and murder by soldiers and Buddhist mobs. Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News, Naipitor in Myanmar. Theresa May will deliver a major speech within the next three weeks outlining the future relationship that Britain wants to have with the EU after Brexit. It's being seen as important as her Florence speech, which is the first stage of negotiations. She'll outline what the government is seeking in relation to security, trade and workers' rights. The North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, has invited the South Korean president for talks at the earliest possible date. The invitation was given by Kim Jong-un's sister, who is visiting the South for the Winter Olympics. As he left the Games, the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence joined Washington and insisted that Washington and Seoul were united in their desire to isolate the North because of Pyongyang's nuclear and ballistic missile program. Uh, Laura Bicker reports now. Her report does contain some flash photography. This is no ordinary messenger. Kim Yo Chung, the sister of the North Korean leader, is the first of her family to set foot on South Korean soil. As the two sides take their seats, the cameras spot a blue folder, a handwritten invitation to travel north and for the two leaders to meet. Kim Jong-un's younger sister is not used to this spotlight. She's usually behind the scenes as Pyongyang's PR queen. On this occasion, she is the perfect charmer for this charm offensive. It's quite typical of North Korea to actually do this sort of thing. They're stealing a little bit of the limelight away from South Korea as the whole world's press descends on it. Um, and they're also trying to sort of control the message between the two. It's very, very hard for South Korea, even though they've been talking about pressure, sanctions, to basically refuse these kind of advances from North Korea. The US Vice President has looked increasingly isolated on this visit, refusing to even greet the North Koreans while pushing for tougher sanctions on the regime. These Winter Games have provided South Korea with a diplomatic breakthrough it never thought possible, but it also presents serious challenges. Does President Moon accept this invitation, and if so, under what kind of preconditions? And he's also discovering that in befriending his neighbour to the north, he risks alienating a key US ally. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Pyeongchang. More than a third of child deaths and serious injuries caused by neglect in England are linked to parents who drink too much alcohol. 
That's according to a new parliamentary report. It also found that nearly all councils have cut their budgets for alcohol support services. Our health correspondent, Adina Campbell, reports. Dad of six, Josh Connolly, knows firsthand about the damage alcohol can have on a family. His father was an alcoholic and died when he was nine. I remember one particular instance, he smashed all, he smashed all the windows through by the door and he was waving a knife through, the, through one of the, the windows and the police coming up and taking him away. At the same time as trying to deal with it all, you, you're, you're also trying to keep it secret. So it's, it's about just keep suppressing it and, and, and so you, you naturally get like unhealthy coping mechanisms. The impact of parents abusing alcohol in England are outlined in a new parliamentary report. It found more than a third of child deaths and serious injuries through neglect were linked to parents drinking alcohol, while nearly two-thirds of all care applications involved misuse of alcohol or drugs. And children with alcohol-dependent parents had feelings of stigma, shame and guilt. The report also used data from a Freedom of Information investigation, which found almost all councils in England are cutting back their budgets for this kind of care. When we, when we start to understand that addiction and alcoholism is all based on trauma, it's all escaping some kind of trauma, if we understand that if helping children, we, we can begin to break the cycles and prevent you know, addictions of the future. The government says work is underway on a new children of alcoholic strategy in addition to new higher duties to target cheap alcohol. Josh has turned his life around, but he believes there are many children who will end up suffering in silence. Adina Campbell, BBC News. And our latest headlines on BBC News. Charities are warned that they could lose government funding if they don't cooperate fully with the authorities in cases of sexual exploitation by staff. Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson is holding talks in Myanmar about the return of Rohingya Muslims. A report commissioned by a group of MPs warns of major problems faced by children in England whose parents drink too much. Energy companies should be allowed to see the personal data of some customers at risk of being in fuel poverty, that's according to the government. The idea is part of a consultation looking into uh, how best to protect people who could be struggling to pay their bills. Our business correspondent Joe Lynham explains. We all hate getting our energy bills, but for some it can push them into real financial difficulties known as fuel poverty. Now the government wants to find a new way of automatically protecting up to two million energy users by letting suppliers know a lot more about them. It's launching a consultation into something called data matching, which could allow local authorities to share personal information about customers with their energy suppliers. But only with their consent and if users are getting state benefits and are in financial trouble. Then they could be automatically placed on a cheaper safeguard tariff for their gas or electricity. Four million people are already on that lower rate. The energy watchdog Ofgem says anyone placed on the new lower safeguard tariff could save at least £66 a year if this plan to share personal information proceeds. That could be valuable as household energy bills are rising. Joe Lynham, BBC News. A helicopter has crashed in the Grand Canyon state of Arizona, killing three people. At least four others were injured. The aircraft was thought to be carrying tourists. The cause of the crash isn't yet known. Hundreds of fire deaths may be linked to the use of skin creams containing paraffin. A BBC investigation has found that most of the creams, which are used to treat conditions such as eczema and psoriasis, do not carry warnings despite concerns about their safety. Well, Kirsten Beacat has been uh, telling us about her dad, Brian, who's from Bradford, who used skin creams for dry skin and a leg ulcer. He died last September after accidentally setting himself alight while smoking a cigarette. 22nd of September last year, uh, got the police called round at my house to tell me to get quickly to the uh, Pinderfields Hospital, where they have a burns unit, and my dad had just been airlifted there after an accident and when I got there I found that he had 
more than 50% um, burns. He had, he had uh, third degree burns and he didn't stand a chance. The doctor told me um, he wouldn't survive and to prepare ourselves for the worst. He, uh, we think, onto the balcony for a cigarette uh, in his dressing gown and pyjamas and um, somehow set himself on fire and then couldn't get it out quickly enough to avoid the third degree burns which killed him 14 hours later. It's uh, Kirsten Bikar there talking about her father, Brian. Uh, well, Chris Bell is a watch commander at West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. He's been telling us that the build-up of paraffin on clothing can accumulate over a long period of time. They're vitally important for medical conditions, but unfortunately they do get into fabrics, clothing, dressings and bandages and bedclothes. And, and it, the, the paraffin impregnates the clothing. So over a period of time, you're left with a paraffin base in that fabric, and unfortunately, that becomes quite flammable. Now, the medicines regulator, the MHRA, says that it is conducting a review of paraffin-based skin creams, and it is working closely with manufacturers and the fire service to further reduce the risks associated with products. And just to say you can uh, hear more on that story on BBC Five Live Investigates. That's this morning, uh, a little bit later, at 11 o'clock on BBC Radio Five Live. Now then, uh, Valentine's Day might still be a few days away, uh, but love was in the air as the cast and crew screening of Idris Elba's new film, Yardi. This is the moment that Idris went down on one knee and proposed to his girlfriend, Sabrina. And the actor was greeted with cheers from the cinema audience as he popped the question. This was at the Rio Cinema in Dalston in East London. Uh, she did say yes, he'll be pleased to know. And the couple have reportedly been dating since early last year. So congratulations to them. Now then, before the paper review, uh, we're going to have all the latest uh, thoughts for you, a full sports roundup, including, of course, the Winter Olympics. Here's Nick Marshall McCormick. Hi, Nick. Well, let's just uh, take you back to the Winter Olympics briefly. You might have seen in the build up to events in Pyeongchang that North and South Korea created a combined ice hockey team. Well, they lost their opening match 8 0, sadly, but uh, it was the North Korean cheerleaders who stole the show in the arena. Now, people had to change seat in the venue so that they could all sit together. This was the result. Nice bit of North Korean synchronization. <laughs> the way only North Koreans can do it. Okay, uh, much more on that coming up actually in the paper review. We're going to be talking about uh, the Winter Olympics and uh, North Korean detente. But in the meantime, let's uh, look at the weather forecast. Here's Nick Miller.